Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Beyond Design Controls 101, following the regulation versus understanding its intent. My name is John Spear and I'm the founder and VP of Quality and Regulatory at Greenlight Guru and I will be the moderator for today's event. We've got a really special presentation scheduled for you today. I know our presenter Mike Drews is really looking forward to sharing his valuable insights and regulatory expertise on design controls for medical devices and the most effective way to approach this critical process. Before we dive too deep into today's presentation and introduce our presenter and his consultancy, Vascular Sciences, I'm gonna to touch on a few items real quick. Yes, most common question I always get is, will this be recorded and will we have access to the slides? Absolutely, That's this is what we do every time we do a webinar at Greenlight Guru, and those will be in your inbox probably later today and available on demand uh, on our website uh, within the next day or so as well, so absolutely. Also, today's webinar is gonna run for about 60 minutes in total and we'll include a Q&A session at the end where Mike has agreed to stick around to answer as many of your questions as time permits. So I would encourage you throughout today's presentation to submit your questions on uh, the right hand uh, on the box on the right hand side and we'll get to as many of those as we can uh, at the tail end of today's session I'd also like to share a few words about Greenlight Guru and why we put on these free training sessions if you've ever been on one of our training sessions before then you know we put these on because improving the quality of life is our mission here at Greenlight Guru and this is likely a mission that's very similar to many of you who are on today's call Anything that we can do as an organization that helps device makers bring safer, life-changing devices to market quicker and with less risk aligns with that mission. We're constantly looking for ways to fulfill that mission, whether that's through hosting these free training sessions, through partnering with world-class medical device consultants like today's presenter, Mike Drews, or through our award-winning medical device QMS software. If you'd like to learn more about why medical device companies from across the globe are moving away from paper-based general purpose quality management systems and adopting the purpose-built medical device quality management system from Greenlight Guru, then I would encourage you to head over to www.greenlight.guru after today's presentation to schedule your free personalized one-on-one -on -one demo. In doing so, you'll learn how the very best medical device companies are leveraging our purpose-built quality management software to gain ISO 1345 certification market clearance and approval, breeze through audits, and push beyond just compliance to produce true quality medical devices. So again, if you're interested in learning how we can help your medical device company, make sure you visit www.greenlight.guru after today's webinar and schedule your personalized demo. All right, let's get on to today's presentation. And let me give you a proper introduction to today's presenter and partner of ours here at Greenlight Guru, Mike Drews. Michael Drews. PhD is, uh, I always like to give him a hard time about this and, and uh, I'm sure he'll chuckle here in a moment, but as president of Vascular Sciences, a consulting and training company offering a broad range of services to medical device, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, including creative regulatory strategy and competitive regulatory intelligence, regulatory submission design, FDA presentation, preparation and defense. Dr. Drews has received his bachelor's master's and PhD degrees in biomedical engineering from Iowa State University and Ames, Iowa. He has worked for and consulted with leading medical device, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies ranging in size from startups to Fortune 100 companies. He also works on a regular basis for FDA Health Canada, the US and European patent offices and the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services and other regulatory and government agencies around the world. Mike is an internationally recognized expert and featured keynote speaker on cutting edge medical technologies and regulatory affairs. He conducts seminars and short courses for medical device, pharmaceutical and biotech companies and regulatory and government agencies uh, around the world. Finally, Mike is an uh, adjunct professor of medicine or has been or is, a, yeah, I think this is right, as an adjunct professor of medicine, biomedical engineering and biotechnology. Mike teaches graduate courses in regulatory affairs and clinical trials, clinical trial design, medical device regulatory affairs, and product development, combination products, pathophysiology, excuse me, 
medical technology and biotechnologies at several universities and medical schools on premise and online. So without further ado, let me hand it over to today's presenter, Mike Drews. Thank you very much, John, for that very kind and somewhat long-winded introduction. I want to thank you and the rest of the Greenlight team for the opportunity to conduct this seminar to, uh, webinar today. And I want to especially thank those of you in the audience, both listening uh, live right now, as well as anyone who might listen in the future to the recording, because without you, we would just be wasting our time. The only thing that I want to uh, add or emphasize to my background that John just mentioned in, is that in addition to doing all of those things that, uh, that John just mentioned, I work as a consultant for the FDA as well as uh, Health Canada and a few of the other regulatory bodies around the world. And the reason why I say that, quite frankly, is because there's not a lot of people who can say that, who work on both sides of that proverbial fence. And so I really want to try to use that to my advantage. And so uh, we're going to be talking about design controls today, but I'm going to approach it a little differently than uh, many other people approach this topic where here's basically what the regulation says, go do it, end of discussion, don't let the door hit you and you know what on the way out. What I want to focus on is the intent of the regulation, specifically the design controls, because I think this is one of the reasons why so many companies, they, they get in trouble with the FDA because they focus on the regulation rather than understanding what the intent of that regulation really is. In other words, why do we have it? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? But before beginning, I just wanted to uh, start by um, asking the audience a couple quick questions. I just have three, um, and these are yes or no questions. So John, if you could pop these up. The first question is, do you currently work in a design control environment? Do you currently work in a design control environment? If you can just answer uh, yes or no to that question in the next few seconds, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, I suspect, I'm guessing, John, that most of our audience does because most medical devices, um, we are required to follow the design controls, but not all of them. Certain class one medical devices are exempt from design controls, and of course, wellness devices which are not regulated by the FDA in any way, shape, or form. Uh, wellness devices, obviously, there's no design control requirements as well. But how many in the audience are currently working in a design control environment? Sure. So uh, we had uh, uh, a pretty overwhelming response, 88% yes, and 12% uh, said no. Okay, great. That's about what I anticipated. And uh, my next question uh, this is a little more of an interesting question to me. Would you follow the design controls if you were not required to do so? In other words, is, if the design controls did not exist, or if FDA did not say if you make a medical device, you had to follow the design controls, would you follow them if they were not required? And for my friends who are working on wellness devices, perhaps 12% of the audience that are not following design controls, maybe you're working on wellness devices, would you follow them anyway? What do we have for a response for that one, John? We got about, uh, let me get a few more seconds here. We got about 75% uh, people responded. So it um, uh, looks like uh, similar, but a little bit different actually. 82% uh, said yes, they would, and 18% said no, they would not. Interesting. Uh, I would love to hear more from that 20% that said uh, they would not and why, but uh, interesting. And then finally, the last question, uh, which I think is my favorite, do you think you understand not just the mechanics of the design controls, in other words, what they require, but do you also understand their intent? In other words, why do we have them? So once again, um, John, uh, it's a yes or no question. Yeah. Let's Let's give the audience just a couple of seconds and let's see if uh, if they understand not just the mechanics, but the intent. Yeah, Mike, these are fantastic questions. I, I always love how thought-provoking your poll questions are. So uh, good job as always. So uh, again, um, about uh, three-fourths of the respondents and we had 76% uh, said yes to this one and 24% said no. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for responding to that last question, those 24% that said no. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your candor. 
I suspect, you know, John mentioned in my intro that I teach part-time at a few different universities. I'm not going to give you a test to see if you really understand their intent, but I suspect some of you in the audience might think you know the intent, um, but after today's presentation, we'll find out if you really do. All right, so moving on to the subject matter, here are some of the things that I'm hoping to talk about in the very short time that we have together. What are the design controls, but much more importantly, why do we have them? Who's required to follow them and who is not? What if we don't have a design control system in place? How early in the development process do design controls apply? What do, uh, sorry, how do we control the design process without actually controlling it? How do we take a holistic approach? That is, how do we integrate design controls with risk management and CAPA and all, um, and all the other things? What happens if we modify or change uh, our device or the process that we use to make the device? What does FDA look for in a design control system? How do the design controls apply to combination products? I'll mention that very, very briefly. And finally, what are the design control challenges of the future when it comes to things like 3D printing and other kinds of technologies? That's a, a pretty ambitious uh, list of questions to discuss in the very short time that we have together, but I'm going to try my best uh, to do that. Most importantly, though, is that knowing what the regulation says, knowing what the design controls say, Although that's certainly a good start, it's definitely not enough. We have to understand the intent of that regulation. In other words, uh, what is it that that regulation is, is trying to accomplish um, as opposed to just following the regulation like a recipe, like a computer executing lines of code one after the next after the next without stopping and asking what, what does this really mean, why is it important, and so on. So a quick uh, disclaimer as we get started here, I can't make you an expert in design controls in just a few minutes that we have to get it. I'm not even going to try, but I want to share with you my philosophy of education, which is to try to teach you how to think, not what to think. And this is very applicable to the design controls because the design controls, um, and I cannot be uh, more more um, crystal clear on this than, 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 than the following, the design controls are not about a set of rules and regulations. The design controls are a set of um, a, a, a way of thinking. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, more in a moment. And speaking of thinking, sometimes people ask me, is it possible to think regulatory? Or in this case, is it possible to think uh, design controls? The late, great Carl Sagan said that science is uh, a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge. Well, my spin on this is that regulatory affairs in general and design controls in particular is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of rules and regulations, or at least it should be. It's not about following a recipe, step one, step two, step three. Yeah, that's important, but there's a lot more to it than that. This is a very uncommon approach. But if it, you know, if if we did take this approach, and this happens to be my approach, then perhaps Carl Sagan would be proud. All right. Uh, if you want more information beyond what I cover in the webinar, there are uh, a few sources that I'll share with you. First, from the FDA. Uh, obviously, FDA put out this guidance on design controls that goes back to 1997, so it's now 20 years old. Some people have suggested that this guidance actually be updated. I've said to the FDA many, many times, do not touch this guidance. This guidance does not, to be, does not need to be changed in any way, shape, or form, at least in terms of the content, the subject matter, because this is, to me, this is prudent engineering. This is common sense, and it does not need to be uh, updated. And by the way, one other thing that I'll mention is, you know, when I started out in this business almost 30 years ago as an R&D engineer, we had a heck of a lot less regulation than we do today. The guide, sorry, the um, design controls did not exist then. And yet somehow, I don't know how this happened, John, but somehow we were able to get reasonably decent medical devices onto the market. Fast forward almost, 30, almost uh, three decades later, and we have thousands and thousands of pages of regulation, including the design controls. But the question is, 
are our medical devices really any better? Are they really more safe and effective? Is the world a better place? I'll leave that as a rhetorical question, but as a regulatory consultant, I've never made the assumption that the amount of regulation that we have is a function of, or sorry, let me say it again, the safety and efficacy of our devices is a function of the amount of regulation that we have. In other words, just because we have more regulation, I don't assume that our devices are safe and effective. And by the way, that street runs in two directions. Just because we have less regulation doesn't necessarily mean our devices are less safe and effective. So, you know, I'll leave that as a rhetorical comment, but if anybody wants to discuss that during the Q&A at the end of this webinar, I would be very happy to do that. Beyond just the guidance, uh, if you want to know uh, more, um, I've done a number of webinars with Greenlight. I put on this particular list webinars that um, are directly or in, indirectly related to what we're talking about today. For example, design validation, user needs and design requirements, change management, um, design transfer, and of course, risk. These are all topics that I'm going to talk about very briefly in today's webinar, but if you want to take a deeper dive into any of these topics, I would encourage you to check out these other webinars uh, that are also available through the Greenlight website. Uh, and one last thing about me is, uh, you know, I put out a lot of columns and articles and podcasts and webinars and a variety of topics with uh, Greenlight as well as other organizations. So if you're interested, uh, check these out. Uh, there might be something in there that uh, that might spark your your interest. Uh, by the way, just a short uh, shout out uh, for the the medical device podcast series that John and I do for Greenlight. Um, I'm told that we've now surpassed 300,000 downloads for that particular podcast series. Uh, so that's something that uh, quite frankly is kind of impressive to me. And I also found out recently that FDA has posted on their internal website for their reviewers several of the webinars that I've done over the last couple of years. So, uh, so I'm glad that the, that the word is getting out. Okay, so again, I want to get focused into the design controls here and starting out uh, with one of my favorite places uh, on the quality side of FDA's website. And this is what I call the preamble to the quality system regulation. And I just want to uh, reiterate a few things uh, from FDA. This is not from my crews, this is from FDA. They say because regulation must apply to so many different types of devices, the regulation, including the design controls, does not prescribe in detail how a manufacturer must produce a specific device. Rather, the regulation provides a framework that all manufacturers must follow, requiring that manufacturers develop and follow procedures uh, and fill in the details that are appropriate uh, to them for their given device, for their given technology, and so on. Manufacturers should use good judgment, and I cannot emphasize that point enough, good judgment when developing their quality system, including their design controls, and apply those sections of the QS regulation and of the design controls that are applicable to their specific products and op op operations. It's the responsibility of each manufacturer to establish requirements for each type of device or technology that they're working on that will result in devices that are safe and effective. And finally, the responsibility for meeting those requirements and for having objective evidence for meeting these requirements may not be delegated, even though the actual work might be delegated. And then the last part of the preamble to share is the essential elements that a quality system, or the, including the design controls, shall embody without prescribing specific ways to establish these elements. Because the quality system regulation, including the design controls, covers a broad spectrum of devices, production processes, and so on, it allows some leeway. I would say it allows a lot of leeway in the details of the quality uh, elements. It's left the manufacturer, that is you in this audience, to determine the necessity for or the extent of some of these elements and to develop and implement specific procedures tailored to, um, to their particular processes and devices. Bottom line, quality in general, design controls in particular, should not be a cookie cutter process. This is yet again another reason why it's important to understand the intent of the regulation so we can do exactly what FDA is suggesting that we do here, and that is adapt that regulation to us, given our technology, given our devices, and so on and so on. Your quality system, your approach to the design controls, 
should not be the same as every other company out there. If it, if it is, quite frankly, in my opinion, you defeat the whole purpose of having a quality system and having design controls in place. They need to be tailored. They need to be uniquely tailored uh, to your particular business. So the logic of this, by the way, should be applied to all regulations, not just quality or design controls, uh, no exception. So let me simplify all of the words from the FDA website that I just shared with you with my words, and here's my philosophy of the design controls, and that is design control should not be about a hard and fast set of rules. Absolutely not. Rather, it's about understanding the intent of those rules, or let's not call them rules, let's call them suggestions, and approaching that process in a logical and a systematic fashion. The late, great Douglas MacArthur said that rules are mostly made to be broken and are too lazy for, uh, sorry, are too often for the lazy to hide behind. This is one of my favorite uh, quotes to share, especially when I do presentations for regulatory audiences like RAPS, for example, because when I show them this quote, they think this is heresy. Some people will actually throw things at me, uh, which I would argue is a good thing because at least I know they're paying attention. But don't miss my message here. I'm not saying that rules are not important, and I'm certainly not saying don't follow the rules. I'm not advocating anarchy. But what I am saying is this. If the rules make sense, if the design control rules make sense, then follow them. But if the design control rules don't make sense for our particular situation and we follow them anyway and we agree with that they don't make sense and yet we follow them anyway, is that a problem with the system or is that a problem with us? So bottom line, don't just follow the rules, think. And this, in fact, is one of the most common reasons why companies get into trouble because they focus on meeting the regulatory requirements. They focus on following the rules, ticking the boxes as opposed to understanding their intent. So what are the design controls and why are they important? Well, let's take this phrase design controls and pick it apart just a little bit. Design, most people have a, a good connotation of what design means, the creative process of coming up with a, uh, a new idea and implementing that idea in reality. And then control, okay? So now we're trying to put some limits, some, some boundaries, some rules on that. Well, here's where it gets interesting because are they are these two words words that we want to put together? In other words, what happens when we combine the words design can, uh, and control? Is the design process something that you really want to control? You know, I find it to be a bit ironic that we refer to this phrase design control, but how many people even ask the question, gee, is that something that we even really want to do? So as a biomedical engineer, first and foremost, and then you know, also as a regulatory consultant, here's the way I sort of reconcile this. We want to add some structure, some guidelines to the design process, but we do not want to control it. Right? So there's kind of a fine line there, but we, we, we want to allow creativity. We want to allow flexibility. You know, again, I mentioned earlier, I started out in this business 30 years ago as an R&D engineer, probably before some people in this audience were even born. Um, most people working in R&D, and I suspect this is probably still true today, they're not keen on following a lot of rules and having a lot of paperwork because as an R&D engineer myself, that really holds me back. That really slows me down. That really limits my creativity. And that's not what regulation, including the design controls, are supposed to be. So don't think of the design controls as a hard and fast set of rules. So what goes into the design controls? Well, this is something actually, uh, sorry, uh, this is something that I got from um, Wikipedia recently. Uh, so since 1990, FDA has required medical device manufacturers that want to make certain types of medical devices to follow the design controls. And at a high level, these are some of the things that are included, and I'll touch on some of these in the next few minutes. Design inputs and outputs, design verification and validation, design review, uh, design transfer, design challenges, and then the associated paste paperwork that goes with it, uh, sorry, design changes rather, and then the associated paperwork that goes with it, like the device history file and so on. Again, I'll touch on these uh, more in a few minutes. Um, in the EU, we have similar but not the same regulation, but here's the most important part. The objective of the design controls is to require, I don't like to use the word require, I would rather say suggest or remind manufacturers, because this to me is just prudent engineering, to remind us to follow a methodologically sound process 
in order to develop a medical device with the intent of improving the probability that the device will reach an acceptable level of efficacy and safety, whatever acceptable level means. Of course, you know, there's a lot of assumptions built into this statement. We're talking about meeting the label. So what happens when devices are used off-label? You know, there's a litany of, of, of possibilities that we can talk about here. But, uh, but that's the most important part. It's a, it's a way of adding some structure uh, to the development process, which, if you've worked in R&D before, can be a pretty chaotic process. To me, this is all common sense. To me, this is what I call prudent engineering, something that we used to teach in engineering school back in the day. I'm not sure if we still do. The question is, if we really did still teach this in engineering school today, would we really need the design controls? Again, I'll leave that as a rhetorical question, but if anybody wants to talk about that at the end of the webinar, I'd be happy to do so. So how about an example? How do we apply design controls to this particular situation? So let's say that a physician comes to us with a, an idea for a new wound care device. Okay, So that would be what could be considered the user need. That's usually where this process starts. But one of the underlying assumptions of the design controls, which I think really gets us into trouble a lot, is that why would we assume that the user knows what they need? In other words, one of the most basic tenets of the design controls, as we'll talk about, is to make sure that the device that we design will meet the, the user need. But why would we assume that the user knows what they need? They probably think they know what they need but they might not actually know what they really need. And this gets into an interesting discussion of evolutionary versus revolutionary product development. And very, very quickly, I'll give a quick example. So today, cars are, are ubiquitous. But back in the day, there were no cars. So imagine we lived in a world where everybody was riding horses. And your business was uh, goal was to design uh, a, a new, a better mode of transportation. And so one of the first things that you would do, being a, a diligent student of the design controls, is you would go out and talk to your users and you would ask them, what would you like to see in a better mode of transportation? And most, and again, keep in mind that back then, everybody is still riding horses and nobody has a car. So most likely, your users are going to say, I want a bigger horse, a stronger horse, a faster horse. But they're all going to say, you know, I want some form of a horse. How many of your users are going to say, gee, a horse is pretty good, but what I really want is a car? What I'm, dif what I'm differentiating here is between evolutionary versus revolutionary product development. The design controls are very good at addressing evolutionary product development. Not so good about, about addressing revolutionary product development, but that's a topic of a, of a completely different and more advanced discussion. So back to the, to, the, to the problem here, the physician comes to you with an idea for a wound care device. You talk to the physician and quickly you come up with the, uh, with the notion that you need more information, obviously. So as an engineer, you need to translate that user need into what we call design inputs. In other words, how is the device going to work? What's the size? What's the properties? What's the material characteristics? And so on and so on. Because an engineer cannot design a product until we have more specific design inputs. Okay, so that's the, the next step. Following that, now we have the design process. So the engineer will take these design inputs and we'll come up with different design ideas, different prototypes, we'll do some testing and so on. Eventually, we get to um, the design output, which is essentially the result of the design process. It's the design of the device, um, um, you know, the, what, it, what it does, how it works, the materials. By the way, uh, I would also include the manufacturing process uh, to, to make that particular device and so on. But that's not the end because then we get to the verification and validation steps. Verification, sometimes people summarize is, did we design the right device? And validation, did we design, uh, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Verification is, did we design the device right? And validation, did we design the right device? Those are not the same questions. And by the way, those are gross over, oversimplifications. I'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. And then we end up with our final device. And of course, we're done. Or are we? No, absolutely not. Remember, as I mentioned a moment ago, medical device design is a very evolutionary, very iterative process. So we come up with a device, 
then we tweak it, we make it a little bigger, a little shorter, a little fatter, or thinner, we turn it into a, a, a new device, and now the process starts all over again. So at a very high level, soup to nuts, <coughs> that is the design control uh, process. Uh, but, you know, again, as I mentioned a moment ago, isn't this just prudent engineering? Isn't this just common sense, something that we used to teach in engineering school back in the day? And just as a prequel as to some of the challenges for the future, what are the challenges of design controls in the future? Uh, in other words, what's the future of, of medicine? Well, with all due respect, the future of medicine, the future of medical devices, is not making thousands or millions of the same devices. Absolutely not. That is not the future. The future instead is personalized medicine. With 3D printing and other technologies, um, we now have the ability to make a device, to design and manufacture a device specifically for one patient. In other words, instead of taking the one-size-fits-all kind of approach as we have in the past, uh, we're going to take one device for one patient. Suffice it to say, the design controls, at least when you when you read the the, the 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 regulation of the design control, they were clearly not written for personalized medicine. But if you look beyond the words and if you understand the intent, the philosophy, if you will, of the design controls, the philosophy of the design controls is just as applicable to a device that you're making for thousands or millions of people as it is for just a single individual. So again, this would be the topic of a much more advanced discussion, but uh, but um, you get the idea. Okay, so why are the design controls important? Uh, well, the textbook answer is to ensure that devices meet our user needs, intended uses, and specific requirements. It's a noble goal, but it's not nearly as simple as that. There are a lot of underlining assumptions I mentioned a moment ago. Why would we assume that the user knows, in fact, they, they, uh, what they need. In terms of intended uses, you know, the design controls is quite specific. In terms of designing device to meet the on-label uses of the device, but what about the off-label uses of the device? Um, is the, are the design controls intended to address that? As a professional biomedical engineer, I think it's irresponsible for us to design a device when we know it's going to be used off-label in a certain way and we do not include that in our design process in some way. I know from a regulatory and a quality perspective that makes people very nervous, but I do not work in the theoretical world of regulatory affairs where people simply uh, read and follow what's on our label. I work in the real world of the practice of medicine and I think we as responsible medical device developers have an obligation, maybe not a regulatory obligation, but certainly a, a professional obligation to understand how our devices are used in the real world and try to design them appropriately as opposed to in the theoretical world where people just read and follow the labels. As I said a moment ago, design controls are applicable to most regulated medical devices, but not all. There are some exceptions. And my favorite is a wellness device. For those of you that are not familiar with wellness devices, I did a webinar on wellness devices uh, for Greenlight a, a year or so ago, so I would encourage you to, to take a look at that. But wellness devices are exempt from all FDA regulations. So there's no 510K or de novo or PMA. There's no um, FDA registration. There's no quality management system. There's no design controls. There's no nothing. I literally mean nothing. If we had a wellness device ready to go and on the market, uh, sorry, ready to go right now, we could put it onto the market this afternoon. Now, I'm not recommending or suggesting that we do that. In fact, I still recommend to the wellness companies that I work with that they do a lot of the things that are outlined in the design controls because I think they're prudent engineering. But in the wellness world, they're not required. Um, obviously, we need to do similar things in the EU for the medical device directives, now the MDRs. But, um, you know, the, the design control system needs to comply with the quality and the ISO requirements, but as I said earlier, it should not be a cookie cutter approach. Okay, let's continue on. So here is uh, uh, the textbook uh, design control process. Uh, I'm not going to talk about each of these steps, but suffice it to say that this is a theory, this is not always reality. A very common question that I get from people is when are when should the design control 
uh, process begin in the product development uh, process? How early in R&D should it begin? Well, interestingly enough, nowhere in the design controls is it specified exactly when the design controls are supposed to kick in. And in my opinion, it should not be specified. It should be up to us. Uh, bottom line, even though in early R&D, many companies do not follow the design controls, and I think legitimately so, because it's just, um, you know, it's just burdensome. It just holds us back. But there are things that we can be doing early in R&D to make the transition to design controls later in the development process more efficient. Now, again, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm talking about the paperwork that's involved here. I'm talking about all of the documentation and so on. In other words, if we have you know, a dozen or more iterations of a prototype, why is it necessary for me to document each one of those dozen or more iterations when most of them will never in a million years come to market? So I'm taking a more practical, a more pragmatic kind of a, approach. I want to meet the intention of the regulation, but at the same time, I don't want it as, to use it in as, as an excuse to hold us back. And another common scenario that I see companies run into is if a larger company acquires a small company and the small company doesn't follow design controls, or if they kind of follow the design controls, but they don't have all of their documentation ducks in order, then that can make that transition into the larger company that much more challenging. The last thing that I would encourage is for somebody to uh, recreate that documentation retrospectively and make it appear as if that documentation was created before it was actually, uh, before it actually was. So what I recommend to companies, and I see this happen a lot, is go ahead and, and back document as best you can uh, what you need to document, but make it painfully obvious that we're doing this a year after or two years after or whatever it is. Don't, you know, don't, don't give the impression that, you know, you're, you're, you're retrospectively creating this um, without actually making that very explicit. Once again, I know this is a common scenario, and I suspect maybe some in the audience might have some questions on that when we get to it, uh, uh, the Q&A at the end. Um, Okay, uh, so many of you are probably familiar with some of the basic terms. I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. I want to emphasize the understanding of these things. Uh, here is that famous watershed diagram that, by the way, this does, did not come from FDA. FDA originally stole this from my friends in Ottawa at Health Canada, and Health Canada took it from, uh, from somebody before that. So, you know, they say if you're going to steal, steal from the best. But this is, you know, at a high level of the process. Uh, again, it's a, it's a gross oversimplification at best. So let's quickly go through what some of the, the important concepts are here. Starting with a design input. What's a design input? Well, from the regulation, here's what the regulation says. Um, the design inputs each manufacturer, so establishing main procedures such that the design requirements related to a device are appropriate. Uh, and address the intended use. Remember, that's the on-label use. It does not say anything about off-label. Should it say something about off-label? Perhaps, but that's a topic of a different discussion, including the needs of the user and the patient. Uh, we need to have a mechanism for addressing incomplete, ambiguous, or conflicting requirements. To me, incomplete, ambiguous, or conflicting requirements from an engineering perspective is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, in many cases, it can be a good thing but that's when we have to go back to the user and we have to say, okay, from an engineering perspective, we need to make a choice. Which is more important to you, making something big or making something small? Which is more something more important, making something heavy or light or whatever the, the example is? So what the design controls are reminding us here is that we need to have some sort of a mechanism in place to address it. It's not telling us what to do. Instead, it's sort of suggesting to us how to do that, and then of course we, we, we document that as well. Okay, so what all of this means, I'll leave it up to you, but remember, as I like to say, regulation is all about the interpretation of words and your ability to defend your interpretation. So here up on the screen right now is what the regulation says. You can interpret these one words one way, I might interpret them another. The F the, your company might interpret them one way, your, the FDA might interpret them another. What I find fascinating is how many people assume 
that the way that the FDA interprets a certain set of words, whether it's the words on the screen now or some other words, is the only way or the best way to interpret those words. And I make, I never make such an assumption. If I agree with FDA's interpretation of a certain set of words, then terrific. But if I disagree with them, I will be the first to go to them and talk to them about it. So digging into the design inputs a little bit further, where do they come from? They could come from a variety of different sources, either internal or external. Um, but uh, one key element, as I said, is to address these incomplete or ambiguous or needs and these user needs, which then will become design inputs. These will sort of frame how we design our device. What we want to avoid is this cartoon, uh, which shows the different ways, the different products that we can end up with, depending on uh, who, who's asking. So that's the the, um, the the reason why design inputs and user needs are important. And one other thing that I uh, suggest that you keep in mind, and it's not mentioned in the design controls, perhaps it should be, is plan for next generations. In other words, label expansions. Oftentimes when a company comes to me, the first thing they tell me is, here's our device, Here's what we want to do with our device right now. But one of the very first questions I ask them is, okay, tell me about what kinds of bells and whistles you may want to add to your device in the future. Because bottom line, the more a company tells me what they want to do with their device, not just now but in the future, the more I can help them. I can do a regulatory risk and a regulatory burden assessment on their wish list of features, so to speak. And many times I'll look at a feature and I'll say, you know what? This particular feature is not very difficult. Why don't we include it in our Gen 1 device? On the other hand, you have another attribute of your Gen 1 device that's going to be a, require a pretty hot, heavy lift. Why don't we shift that to Gen 2? But most important, we have to have the overall game plan in, in, in place. In other words, we have to know the big picture, not just where we are right now. Then we get to the design outputs. Um, which is the, the design of the device, the manufacturing process, and so on. Um, uh, so that's sort of the, the result of, of this process. There's an interesting relationship between uh, user needs and design validation, which we'll talk about in a moment. By the way, user need is not defined in the design control regulation. Perhaps it should be. But design validation is, it says, design validation shall ensure that devices conform to the defined user needs and intended uses. Design validation mean, means establishing by objective evidence, whatever that means, that the device conforms with user needs and the intended use. But again, that's all on-label use. What about off-label use? So this needs to be defined by you, not by the regulation, and I hope you have a section in your quality management system where you build some of these things out uh, in the design controls. In other words, and I'm sure John will have thoughts on this in the Q&A later on, but when it comes to the design controls in your QMS, it is absolutely not sufficient to simply say, we're following design controls. You need to have a much more specific verbiage. I'm not talking about a 300-page PhD dissertation, but you need to have specific verbiage in there as to how you're applying to the design controls uh, given the, the situation that you're in. So quick, simple example. A doctor says that a device needs to be portable. That's our user need. Okay, the engineer is going to say, what does portable mean? In other words, how heavy or how light does this thing need to be? Does it need to be less than a certain number of pounds? And if so, what is that number? Does it need to be transported on a cart? And if so, what's the maximum size of the cart? If the cart needs to fit through a doorway in a hospital, for example, that needs to go into you, you know, as a design input. Smaller than a lunchbox. Okay, well, but how small? <laughs> is that? Does it need to be self-contained? In other words, does it need to connect uh, to something? Does it need power? Uh, can it run off of battery? Does it need to connect to the internet, you know, with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or something like that? So we need to get much more granular. We need to get much more specific when it comes to the design inputs. And then, you know, one of my favorite mantras from Ronald Reagan is trust but verify. Don't take the design inputs that you're, or the user needs from a single user. You should vet this with other users as well to make sure that other users of your product agree because otherwise you run the risk of designing your device that might, you know, one person might like it, but everybody else in the, in the, in the 
universe will say this is a ridiculous device. So vet those user needs. Don't just uh, take them as, as gospel. Uh, and remember, as I said a moment ago, you need to define these things in your QMS. Um, other design uh, inputs, here are some examples, uh, design, device function, characteristics, performance. Again, this is all pretty basic stuff, but these are all the reasons why defining our design inputs important is so, is, is, is so key. So my recommendation when it comes to the inputs is, design, uh, is to identify as many of these as possible at the beginning and then evaluate or and reevaluate them through the design and development process. In other words, prioritize them, but maybe as you gain more information from other users, as you gain more information from the engineering, as you uh, design, as you develop your prototypes, reevaluate these inputs to make sure that they're still the appropriate inputs, to make sure that you're prioritizing them in the correct fashion and so on. And then, of course, test at the end of the process that your uh, outputs met your inputs. This is another way of uh, you know what Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Make sure that your design outputs meet your design inputs. To me, this is 100% common sense. It's kind of unfortunate that we really need regulation to tell us what we should already know, what we should be learning in engineering school, but uh, unfortunately, maybe, maybe uh, not as much as um, uh, is what we would like to think. And keep in mind that uh, what's most important here is what's the clinical problem that we're trying to solve. In other words, what's the root cause? Unfortunately, many medical devices are solutions to the wrong problems. You know, one of the adages that I like to, to share, and we'll wrap this up in just a couple of minutes so that we can have some Q&A and some discussion, is that answers are only as good as the questions that we ask answers are only as good as the questions that we ask. So in other words, what good is getting the right answer if we're asking the wrong question? Well, putting it into engineering terms, putting it into design control terms, what good is designing the right device, is solving the right problem? Uh, I'm sorry, solving a certain problem if it turns out that we're solving the wrong problem. And believe it or not, this actually happens in medicine more frequently than a lot of people like to think. I have lots of examples I can share perhaps in a, in a different webinar, but I'll leave this as a, as a rhetorical question, certainly for the engineers in the audience to think about what good is coming up with the right solution if we're solving the wrong problem. This happens a lot in the medical device universe. One thing that I wanted to touch on very, very briefly is in the, with the advent of combination products, for those that are not familiar, a combination product is not just a medical device or a drug or a biologic, but a combination of two, sometimes all three of those things put together. Probably the best known example of a combination product is the drug eluting stent. That's a device drug combination. I do a lot of work in combo products. I have for a long time. Uh, and one of the common questions that I get is how do we apply uh, uh, desi um, sorry, um, uh, design controls to combination products? Well, FDA has put out some guidance on this. This particular one says final guidance. Um, please <laughs> don't assume that this is final because I guarantee in another period of time there's going to be another version of this guidance come out. I have said to the FDA so many times over the years that you should not use the words draft and final in the context of guidance because they're totally meaningless and worse, they confuse people. I can't tell you how many times people come to me complaining that they've done everything in what they think is a final guidance, and for whatever reasons, it seems not to be sufficient, it's not enough. And I say to them, to quote a famous politician, I feel your pain, but why would you assume that final means final? All regulation, all guidance, including the design controls, is a work in progress. It's constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. So be careful how you interpret the word final here. But back to the, the more important matter. If you understand the, the intent of the design controls, um, and here I gave you a couple of examples of design inputs and outputs taken from the guidance, there's absolutely nothing new here. As a matter of fact, I think in many ways, this guidance, like many guidances from FDA, is a statement of the obvious. If you understand the intent of the design controls, then I don't want to go so far as to say you don't need to read this guidance, but there's nothing in here that's surprising. Now, this is true for device-drug combination products, where the PMOA of the combo products is a device. If you're working on a 
drug-device combo where the PMOA is drug, a pre-filled syringe, for example, or an auto-injector or something like that, then it is a little different because now the primary regulation comes from the drug world, not from the medical device world. But nonetheless, the basic principles still apply. Uh, so the last section I'll go through and then we can uh, have some, some Q&A is uh, the verification and validation. Uh, verification, as I said, did we design the right the device right and validation, did we design the right device? Many people use these questions. I particularly am not crazy about these questions. I'll talk more about that in a second, but most importantly, as I said a moment ago, these questions are not the same as did we solve the right problem? Uh, did we ask the right question? Remember, uh, what good is getting the right answer, the right device, if we're solving the wrong problem, if we're asking the wrong question? So adding a little more words to verification is comparing the output, verifying or ensuring that our output meets our input. That's, uh, that's uh, the, the essence of uh, verification. Uh, do we have the right goals? Are we asking the right questions? Are we solving the right problems? That's all beyond the, the letter of the regulation and the design controls. But I do believe as a professional biomedical engineer, it fits within the intent of the design controls. And if you understand the intent, as I've been talking about now for a while, you'll be okay. Uh, on the validation side, this is testing our device against the requirements. So this is following verification. Uh, one of the things that companies ask me a lot is, do we need to do our final VNV testing on our final device? That's one of the things that the design controls does say. But in reality, that does not always happen. In fact, it doesn't often happen. What we need to do is we need to do our final VNV testing on as close to the final product as we can, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the final, final product. And here's what I mean by that. I've been in many, many situations where we have done final VNV testing on our pre-final product. But in order to make that fly at the FDA, and to me, again, this is common sense. If somebody that doesn't know this already, they should not be in this business. Any differences between your final device and your device that you actually did the testing on we have to show, we have to prove to the FDA that those differences don't matter, that they will not impact the results of those tests. In other words, if we do a test on our, on our you know, previous um, pre-final product and then do the same test on our final product, we would not see any difference. Now, many companies, especially the large companies, they will decide it's just not worth it to spend the time and money to show that that there is no difference. So we'll just wait and do our final VNV testing on our final device. And that's perfectly fine. But a lot of medical device companies will choose to do their final VNV testing on a pre-production device for all kinds of reasons. And they, that's fine as well. You just have to understand that you're going to have to justify that those differences don't matter. And in some cases, it could take more time and money to do that justification than to simply wait and do that final VNV DNV testing uh, on our particular device, uh, final device. So again, there's no right or wrong here. There's advantages and disadvantages to, to both. But bottom line, anybody, any quality or regulatory person who says that you must do your final VNV testing on your final device, they clearly do not understand the intent of the regulation of the design controls. Um, I think I, I have more info to, uh, to go through. John, but maybe at this point, because I know you wanted to limit this to an hour, uh, maybe we'll, we'll kind of uh, call it quits at, at this point and open up to some Q&A and some discussion, and then I'm happy to continue if anybody wants to stick around. All right. Sounds great, Mike. So we do have a few questions. Let's, uh, let's dive into a little bit. Um, so the first question comes from Cyril. Cyril says, Section 7.3 of ISO 13485 does not recommend, it requires standard operating procedures, correct? Well, <laughs> I'll be honest, uh, John, my goal in life is not to memorize and regurgitate regulations, yeah, so right. I would have to go back and, and check 
uh, you know, exactly the section that, that Phil is referring to. But more importantly, I'm, I, I, I'm wondering what's the reason why Phil is asking that question. It's uh, sorry, Cyril. I might have mis mis uh, stated that. Um, oh, yeah, so sorry. No, it's okay. So um, yeah, I agree with you. I'm actually trying to, as we speak, trying to open that particular uh, clause of the standard. Um, Cyril, my take on this is, yeah, as a company, you should have documented ways in which you are doing things, um, but you shouldn't look at this from a um, you shouldn't be doing this just to comply with regulations. You should be doing this because you want to implement uh, repeatable, sustainable, scalable practices. Uh, so, and you know, the intent behind a quality management system, frankly, is to describe your business practices. Yeah, of course, the underlying uh, aspect of this is uh, your interpretation of the regulations and, and how you comply with those, but that shouldn't be the motivation for why you document SOPs. It, the motivation should be so that everyone does things in a consistent manner. All right, so let's, um, and Cyril, if you have more to add to that or, or to expand upon your question, please chime in. But let's move to the next question. Actually, let's John, come. before we do, can yeah, I just sure. add something sure. real quick to what you just said? I agree 100% when it comes to the importance of SOPs and consistency in manufacturing. In R&D, it's a little bit different. Yes, we still need procedures in R&D, but I want a lot more, and I'm speaking, John, as a former R&D engineer myself, I want a lot more flexibility in those sure. procedures in R&D because remember the adage, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. If we have procedures in R&D that are so narrow, that are so restrictive, and I see this in a lot of medical device companies, that hamstrings R&D engineers and it pretty much guarantees that we're going to continue to get the same kinds of devices that we already have. This again goes back to evolutionary versus revolutionary product development. So in manufacturing, I agree 100%. You know, manufacturing by definition is not an experiment. If you do something in manufacturing, you should always know in advance what the result is going to be. And if you get a result that you don't expect in manufacturing, I'm sorry, John, you're not doing manufacturing anymore. But <laughs> yeah. in R&D, you know, you may or may not, you might have a hypothesis as to what you're going to get, but that's why we're doing it in R&D, especially R as opposed to D. Does that make sense, John? Do you, do you agree uh, or do you have a different view? 100%. And, and my um, philosophy on SOPs, if you will, <laughs> are is to be as flexible as you possibly can. Um, and, and I have a, uh, a short story from my past. I won't go into all the details. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the summary. Um, once upon a time, we were working on a guide wire for a catheter product, and it was a, a sort of a, a polymer jacketed mandrel style guide wire for coronary application. Um, it was very rigid and, and torqueable on the back end, and the, but the very tip of the guide wire needed to be super floppy and flexible so that it didn't cause any sort of trauma when navigating through the vasculature. And, and um, you know we had a prototype of this guide wire, and um, well, one of the marketing team members uh, was critical. And the marketing um, person said that he wanted a flexible stiffener. And all the engineers in the room kind of looked at each other um, um, quizzically because that sounded like the the strangest request: a flexible stiffener. Um, an oxymoron. An oxymoron. Like yeah, but I but I use that example because I think that is exactly the intent that we want with our, um, frankly, many of our policies and procedures, especially in R and D, we want flexible stiffeners. Um, you know, a lot of latitude because, to your point, I mean, we're not manufacturing things during development, so really good point. And All I right, think so. that was a wonderful story, John. And and flexible stiffener is a is a is a terrific example of what I talked about earlier when we have conflicting uh, requirements. In that particular case, <laughs> yes. you, you need to go back. You're laughing, John, but you're a design control guru. I'm, you know, I'm trying to link this to the design control. Yeah. Right? So this is when you go back to the user and you say, look, what's more important to you, flexibility or stiffness? Because as an engineer, it might be difficult to accomplish both. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was a fun project. Uh, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll share stories with that later uh, on a podcast or another webinar. Okay, but, I look forward to that. Uh, all right. The next question comes from Morteza. I mean, folks, uh, 
uh, apologies in advance if I happen to mispronounce your name, it's not my intent, but Morteza um, asked sort of an open-ended question, how about veterinary devices? Ah, good question. So um, this could be a topic of a different discussion since most of the audience are not working on veterinary devices, I'll try to make this very, very simple. Um, a medical device used for a companion animal, that is a dog or a cat or something like that, requires absolutely nothing from the FDA, specifically from CVM, the, the Centers for Veterinary Medicine. In other words, no 510K, no de novo, no nothing. The only thing that CVM recommends, and I agree with them on this, is that they is that the manufacturer checks with CVM uh, regarding their labeling to make sure that they're not making any uh, unsubstantiated claims or, or something like that. But veterinary medical devices for companion animals, very, very similar to wellness devices. They don't require anything from the FDA. Now, when it comes to uh, devices that are used on livestock, on cows and pigs and stuff like that, that's a little bit different because in some cases people eat them. But Medical devices, that's, that requires nothing. Animal, drugs for animals, that requires something, not as much as a human drug, but something. And uh, animal devices are a wonderful label expansion. It's what I call a species expansion. Uh, in other words, I've got four or five devices that I've brought onto the market, John, first as a veterinary device. And then I uh, do essentially a label expansion, that's what I call a species expansion, uh, to turn it into a, a human device. Most of the time it works the other way around, but I like to do it uh, that way. The regulation doesn't say that we can or can't do it, so why not use that to our advantage? Yeah, really good point. Um, really good point. So uh, Christine's question is, how would you recommend noting that an engineer is back documenting the design controls? The engineer Should the engineer just put a disclaimer on the document that is being created one to two years after it should have started? Absolutely, uh, and, and, and I do this frequently. Um, usually I'll have like in the introduction or a little preamble or a disclaimer, whatever you want to call it at the beginning, in you know very either big font or bold font or red font or whatever it is, making it very clear that the design that this particular documentation is being created on such and such a day, which is you know a year or two years, whatever after the uh, the, the the work was actually done. And I go usually one step further, John. I will put some explanation as to why. In other words. You know, a common scenario, the, the technology is acquired from a small company by a, by a large company. The small company doesn't have all of that documentation. Um, and so the large company will have to recreate it as best as they can and, um, and, and, and explain the circumstances. And further, I like to be very honest in what I know for sure versus where I'm not sure about. So I will also put in there in the appropriate sections, if we were to reverse engineer this documentation, if you will, make it very clear, we know that this particular test was done this way. However, this other test, we know, what it was, we know the test was done, but maybe the methodology that that test was done by was lost. And so we say that the methodology for that test is not available based on our on our um, discussions with the people that were involved at the time, here is the way we think the, the test was performed. So long story short to, um, what was the person's name, Christina? Um, Christine. Christine, thank you. Uh, Christine, my best advice is be very, very clear in, uh, in, in your disclaimer at the beginning and be very, very honest, very transparent in terms of what you know for sure and, uh, and what you are kind of guessing on. Yeah, and Christine, I'll uh, elaborate a bit more on Mike's uh, thorough explanation, but my advice is, uh, as a best practice, um, try to not let this become the standard practice within your business. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, but, but it's a good point. I mean, don't, don't try to cover some things up. Don't, don't uh, backdate. That is a huge no-no. Just accept that, hey, uh, coulda, woulda, shoulda, uh, this is this is uh, you know we we observe this we found this we're addressing this 
uh, and, and and that sort of thing. But the thorough explanation is is very much advised. And I would agree with you, John. This should not be our standard practice, but you and I both know that in the real world, this happens all the time. And so we need to be very pragmatic with our advice to our audience members and to how to handle these situations and how to handle them appropriately. For sure, absolutely. Uh, next question comes from Dean. Dean states the waterfall diagram has, quote, user needs and, quote, design inputs separate. Why are we not considering the user needs and intended use it, uses as part of the design inputs? That's an interesting question. So I think the question is, and I'd love to hear your thinking on this as, as well, John, but if I interpret the, the question correctly, it's why are the, why is labeling specifically the, um, the indications, why is that not part of the waterfall diagram? Is that the essence of the question? Maybe. Let's, and let me read this again. Why are we not considering the user needs and intended uses part of the design input? So I think what Dean well, is Well, the intended uses is part of the labeling. Right. So I think what Dean is, it might be suggesting here, and, and Dean, certainly clarify if we misinterpret your question, but what I think he's saying is, uh, aren't user needs, and maybe he means indications for use, uh, actually uh, a subset of design inputs? I think, um, well, let me say it this way, and again, I, 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 if I'm understanding the question properly, I think that the labeling, the, um, the intended use, for example, is sort of implied in the user need. In other words, when the, when the user says, you know, I need a device that does X, Y, and Z, presumably that's going to be part of your label. Now, again, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. I know for a fact that there are many devices that are in fact designed to be used off-label as well, but of course that doesn't go into your formal documentation. So I, I, I guess I'm struggling a little bit because I don't completely understand the, the nature of Dean's question. Yeah, well, so Dean, um, uh, if you're still on, uh, I would encourage you to, to submit a follow-up and we'll try to get to that here in a few minutes. But um, what I um, wonder here is, you know, and kind of building on your uh, intended uses and labeling, um, there would be, I would expect um, from a user need perspective that you describe what is important about the labeling or indications, et cetera. There, there's probably something that you're capturing from a user need perspective, whether that be uh, from a patient point of view or even from a clinician point of view. I mean, is there some key information that's really important about that? Um, I would expect that you would elaborate on that further in the form of design input requirements, especially like if there's certain symbols or, or criteria like, uh, you know, expiration dates and or sizes and, and et cetera, that those would be elaborated further uh, as, as design input requirements. Uh, and then, of course, you know, through your design outputs and the rest of your design and development, you would have the ev evidence to, to corroborate that. And John, perhaps it will help if I give a specific example. This is actually in a, uh, one of the case studies I was going to share. Maybe I'll do this as a, a part two version of this webinar so we can uh, talk about some of these things in more detail. But most in the audience are probably at least generally familiar with a bare metal coronary stent. Never mind, you know, a fancy schmancy drug loading stent, just a bare metal coronary stent. The question is, what would be the user need if we were developing a, a brand new bare metal coronary stent for the first time today. Well, one physician might come to you and say, I need something that will prop open a clogged artery, all right? That would be one user need. And that is clearly the user need that generated the, the, all of the stent-like devices that we have today. But the question is, is that the only user need or is that the best user need? So another user need might be we need to make sure that we get enough oxygen and glucose to the cells downstream from the occlusion in the myocardium. That would lead, that would include not just stents, which is nothing more than a mechanical uh, device to prop open a tube, but that would include um, atherectomy, that would include bypass, that would include uh, um, uh, TMR, trans, trans myocardial laser revascularization, 
That would include angiogenesis. That would include a litany of different solutions, including but not limited to stents. And this is one of the frustrations that I have with the design controls and how it impacts R&D. Because if you task an engineer based on your user need to come up with a solution to a problem where you define the problem to, to mechanically, you know, open up a clogged artery, you're going to get one solution. But if I task that same engineer to give me uh, a solution that will deliver oxygen and glucose to the cells downstream uh, from the occlusion, now you're going to come up with a whole other set of solutions. So even though it's glossed over a lot in the design controls and in the regulations, John, I think as a, as a professional biomedical engineer, one of the biggest limiting factors, one of the biggest challenges is, do, is are our user needs really the, the user needs that we want? It goes back to what I said earlier. Why would the design controls, why would anybody in this, in this industry assume that what they tell you what they need is really what they actually need? Does that make sense, John? Yeah, it, it totally does. Um... You know, there's it's it's there's art in all of this, um, and I think part of the art is is um, doing the uh, appropriate, um, I, I guess, research, if you will, or or an understanding of the situation and the circumstances. Uh, just because it wasn't verbalized or written down from an end user, does not don't assume that the, what was written down and, and verbalized to you is the comprehensive, complete, holistic list of user needs. There's probably a lot more that that were not defined or or communicated. All right, so um, Mike, next, actually Zachary has a two-part question, but we're gonna break this up because these, these questions are different enough that we're not gonna um, blend them together. So the first question Zachary has are, what are some examples of design input categories? For example, are only customer and regulatory requirements design inputs, or would there be design inputs from internal and other external stakeholders. So we'll pause there and, and hear your response to that question before we go to question two. Yeah, it's a great question, Zachary. Thank you for asking. And my apologies because I did have one or two slides uh, specifically talking to that, which I think I probably went over very, very quickly. They will be in the handout for the, the webinar that will be available um, after the fact. But you're exactly right. User needs can come from a variety of different sources, both external, uh, like, for example, physicians, or nowadays uh, we have more and more medical devices that are being used directly by the patient. So user needs might come from the patient, from the consumer, if you will. Uh, but they can also come from internal sources, uh, from your marketing people, for example. Hey, we need a device that, you know, does X, Y, and Z because we think we're going to, you know, be able to sell it or something like that. Uh, so user needs can can come from, uh, or sorry, design inputs can, well, both user needs and, and design inputs can come from lots of different sources. Uh, and in terms of categories, uh, again, I have a slide on this. Um, I won't flip through the deck and it'll make you dizzy to try to find it, but they can be chunked up into several different categories. Uh, might be um, uh, manufacturing, uh, requirements might be biocompatibility requirements, might be, um, what am I forgetting, John? There's a bunch of them. You can help me out here if you want. But there's a um, lot of different uh, yeah. categories that we can lump these into. Yeah, I, I, and to me, categories are, um, uh, I, I think, sort of semantics. Um, to me, I, I, I like, you know, have a kind of a, a list, if you will, of categories uh, as thought-provoking uh, more than anything else. Um, I, I think I've seen categories for functional, performance, safety, uh, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I, uh, I am remembering a, a, a content piece that I wrote oh, probably 15 years ago. I'll have to maybe uh, blow the dust off of it and resurface it. But, um, you know, when you come to design input requirements for your product, my advice is to try to consider as uh, try to be as holistic as you can uh, and consider all the different angles. It's, it's, you know, could be business requirements. There could be a lot of categories. So um, Zach, I hope, I hope that advice helps you just a little bit with understanding that. So let's get to. And actually the wait, what, one second, yeah, John. Sure, sure. Um, I'd like to take that a little bit further. So this is a great example of how uh, I said earlier and how FDA said that this should be, tailored, this should be personalized to your particular device or, or, or company. Uh, 
So I would go so far, and I would love to hear whether you agree with this or not, John. In your quality system, you should have uh, the list of these categories, uh, you know, that John mentioned in terms of functionality or I mentioned in terms of, you know, biocompatibility and so on. Though the details of what goes into each of those categories might be different from one device to the next to the next. But the categories will, for the most part, be the same. So do you think, John, it would be appropriate, for example, in the company's QMS somewhere when they talk about how they are going to follow in, a de in uh, the design controls to maybe um, uh, include those categories and also maybe include a mention of periodically they will reevaluate and see if they need to add a category in the future yeah. if they get into another device area that they weren't into aren't into today uh, for sure and um, I, I don't I don't want this to be misinterpreted but but you know I, I think sometimes there are good um, th this is a good scenario where uh, you could create some sort of checklist and and uh, I don't mean checklist and that you're checking boxes on forms but checklist or guidance if you will to, to kind of help inform uh, you, your development team to make sure that you've covered all the angles that that you know of and and I think it is a good use case to incorporate that in in a procedure uh, of some in some way shape or form and one other uh, point of advice based on uh, some previous experiences on this uh, my advice to you would be to not only include these possible categories for consideration but also maybe include some examples. Um, I'm an engineer. I've worked with many, 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 many engineers. And uh, sometimes, um, well, I'll speak for myself, uh, my engineering self, uh, sometimes we split hairs. We're like, oh, that that's supposed to be functional and you have it labeled as performance, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Um, the, yeah, that's the, semantics. <laughs> that's semantics. But having some examples for for uh, each of those different categories, so that people can sort of, I guess, assimilate uh, or get on the same page, uh, is is a pro tip that I would recommend. Well, speaking of examples, John, let me share with you and our audience a, a specific example that illustrates just that. Uh, and some might in the audience might chuckle, but this is a true story. So a company came to me; they were developing a medical device, a permanent implant that was going to go into somebody's body. And they asked me to help them, you know, get it through the FDA, yada, yada, yada. And we were going through, you know, the list of all of the different things, you know, testing and so on that they've done. And I asked them, I said, so where are you when it comes to biocompatibility testing? And they said, what's that? So clearly, this particular company didn't have in their QMS a list of categories. You know, more, you know, you're laughing, John, so you appreciate my not so subtle use of humor. I would like to think that, and this is going to sound harsh to some people, but I'm going to be brutally honest here. I would like to think that people working in this business, if we're designing a medical device that's going to go into somebody's body for the rest of their life, that they think, you know, gee, it might be a good idea to kind of look at how is the body, specifically the immune system, going to react with the material that this device is made out of. You know, on a personal note, John, I think it's unfortunate that you know, we need regulation to tell people to do these things, but unfortunately, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. Yeah. So, so clearly, if the company had a list of these categories, including biocompatibility testing, that they would not be in this situation. <laughs> but maybe For I'm sure. just naive, John. Well, I, I don't think so, but... Um... <laughs> Um, at least not on this topic. Um, we won't dive into the others. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Zachary's second question is, if an organization has brought to market hundreds of devices already, how should production issues feed back into design? Are production issues more so validation problems, or should they become inputs into design changes? I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to love the, the answer in this question. Yeah, it's a great question, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well, John, but I'll start. I think Zachary is in a somewhat unique position compared to a lot of other folks in our industry because he and his company has an awful lot of what I will refer to in a loose sense as real-world evidence. In other words, I think, you, I think he says he's got lots of products on the market. Uh, what I would strongly encourage is that you is that Zachary and his company take some of that 
um, that historical information and kind of feed it back in to the, the system, the design controls, and the overall QMS that they have today and see if they would have handled it any differently than they did, you know, when, uh, when before. In other words, if they, for example, if they have a problem with the device on the market, um, can and, and they came up with a solution. Can they take that scenario and feed it back into their system uh, and see if it would detect that problem today and 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 be able to to prevent it? So, bottom line, and this is another of the most basic tenets in the design controls, John, is that let your outputs become your inputs. Take that information and feed it back. And for those of you that know yeah. something about biology. This is nothing new here. This is this is you know the nervous system and the endocrine system and the human body work exactly the same way. <laughs> so we can't take credit for for you know the, the concept of feedback. But bottom line, Zachary, I would strongly encourage you to do that. And in those situations where your current system doesn't detect those problems or doesn't handle the, the situation, now you have to figure out maybe even institute a kappa. But now you have to figure out how to make adjustments. To your to your system so that it will detect those things in the future. It's kind of like uh, a risk management file, John. One of the things that frustrates me is that some companies will create a risk management plan as part of the you know the regulatory process and then stick it in a folder and never touch it again. And to me, that defeats the whole purpose of having a risk management plan. As I think you would probably agree, John, it's supposed to be a dynamic thing. You're supposed to revisit it right. from time to time. The regulation doesn't say how often, in my opinion, the, the regulation should not say how often it should be up to us. But, you know, every every year, every month, depending on the technology, we should revisit it to, to update it if necessary. And if something happens, if we're aware of a, of a problem or a complaint, that should be another trigger that we should revisit our risk management plan. So again, I think, Zachary, it's a terrific question. Uh, you, you can use all of that historical information to continue to continue and improve the systems that you have in place today. Yeah, really good points. Um, so I'm um, um, uh, and in the interest of time, um, Mike, um, this will probably be our last question, and I'm gonna kind of blend a couple of things together. So, um, um, so let me ask Rhonda's part of this question first, and then I'll add April's second. So Rhonda states, "What about the interpretation?" versus auditors interpretation do auditors always win and then um, April's uh, part of this is my experience has been that an auditor will point to a single line item in the regulation and say quote you don't have this minor point in the regulation covered why why is there a gap so um, well, it's a, reactions no no I'm just, yeah you're, so it's a, it's a great question. Thank you, uh, both Rhonda and April. Uh, let me do the best I can, and then, uh, as always, John, I would love to hear your your thoughts as well. Uh, so first of all, Rhonda, you can take uh, solace in the fact that auditors do not always win. An auditor can say something or uh, ask you to do something, uh, and you can always push back if you think it's worthy of pushing back on. Now, one of the things I've learned is you have to pick your battles. Right? Some things are worth pushing back on and other things are not. And again, I'll give you, I'll give uh, Rhonda and the rest of our audience uh, a real life example. One of the companies that I work with um, was pinged by an FDA auditor on a manufacturing process, a, pr uh, a manufacturing inspection, because they were not following the industry standard uh, practice for this particular operation that they were doing. And the company said, yes, you're correct. We're not following the standard. Let us explain to you why uh, and long story short, it turned out that they came up with a better way to do something that was that was better than the industry standard. And the auditor said, oh, that makes sense. Thank you very much for explaining that to me. Oh, by the way, here's your 483 anyway. So regrettably, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why so many companies are so paranoid at changing things or making things better um, because they're afraid that it's going to cause problems with the FDA. And one thing that differentiates my approach to this compared to so many others, John, is I refuse to use the FDA or regulation as an excuse to hold me back. 
Uh, I think that um, it's become too easy for many in this industry to just blame regulation or FDA, whether it's design controls or manufacturing or getting a device onto the market or whatever it is. It's become a convenient excuse, and we have to work together to figure out what's the, the best way to do it. So that's the response to, to Rhonda's portion of the question. John, can you remind me of the, the April portion, please? Uh, yeah, so her uh, statement was her experience is that an auditor will point to a single line in the regulation and say, you don't have this minor point in the regulation covered. Why Why is there a gap? Yeah, thank you for the reminder. So first of all, April, that auditor is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They're doing their job. So don't blame the auditor. So here's my response. The question is, why are you not doing whatever it is that they're pointing to? Are you not doing it because in your particular situation, it's not applicable or you're doing something else instead? Or are you not doing it because you're just not aware of it, right? So I can't really advise you further unless I know, you know, in this particular situation, and I know it's a open-ended hypothetical, um, but I would just say, April, you know, don't get too upset with the auditor. Their job is to make sure that, uh, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And if there's something listed in the regulation that says you're supposed to be doing it and, uh, and you're not doing it, then you need to ask the question, why? Did you, did, is it not necessary? Is it not applicable? Or did you just simply forget? What would you add to that, if anything, John? Yeah, I, I, um, if that's the case, I mean, I, I would be diligent about understanding which uh, parts of the regulation you do and do not follow and, and not be silent on it. I would have evidence to corroborate, uh, support why you chose not to do something. And hopefully you're doing that prior to the uh, FDA inspector and the, the ISO auditor showing up. Uh, so and I'll, do, give a, I'll, give, I'll give a quick example before we wrap this up, John. Let's say, let's pick, because April didn't mention it, but I'll just pick, pick one. Let's say sterilization. Let's say that your particular device is supposed to be sterilized before it's uh, shipped out and used, right? And so let's say uh, the auditor says, show me your sterilization records, you know, to make sure in your documentation and your validation and everything. And for whatever reasons, you cannot produce that, right? So now the auditor is going to be thinking, well, gee, is it that you didn't sterilize these devices or is it that you did and you just don't have the documentation? So that's a fair question that I think most auditors would certainly point at. What I think would be an interesting question, and I don't know that most auditors would go to this level, is the auditor would say, okay, you're sterilizing devices using ETO, using ethylene oxide, but as many in the industry know, you know, there's problems with ETO now in terms of availability. Do you have a backup strategy? Can your device be sterilized using gamma, uh, you know, or, or, or something else? That would be an interesting question for an auditor to ask. I think that would be a more common question that an FDA reviewer might ask as part of the clearance or approval process. The problem with, with sterilization, though, now is that all of these devices are, are already on the market. So the FDA reviewers are not involved with it anymore, and now it's the auditors. So uh, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining that scenario, but hopefully by adding a, a specific example, it adds a little more granularity, a little more actionable intelligence to April's question. Yeah, I think that's that's good. I, and Mike, I, I want to thank you so much, folks. I